money is tight, your boss is hard on you, it's snowing again. I think you can get snow here, right? I mean, I know we get lots in Moncton. It's snowing again. When is spring coming? I look forward to spring. It starts to get warm, and you can be outside again without a big heavy coat. Or that Wi-Fi, you know, just too slow, and nothing ever loads the way I like it to, to, to load, and it's not going quickly. But as we look at our text here this afternoon, I hope that we'll all see here that you know, the problems of life and those things that cause us to complain and to be unhappy and so on, it's not your circumstances that cause these things. Not the weather, not the white stuff that comes down, or the Wi-Fi or anything else, or someone else in our life that perhaps we're not happy with. The problem certainly can be that we've taken our eyes off the Lord, our God, off his goodness, off his grace, off of what he has given to us in Jesus Christ. Remember, we have all things in our Savior, and it's very easy to just look at what we have in the here and the now, and when things aren't just going the way we like it to go, we start complaining and complaining about God and how, well, you know, I thought when I became a Christian, things should get easier, not more difficult. I mean, has he promised us an easy life when we came to Christ? I mean, that's the uh, health and welfare, prosperity gospel, isn't it? Everything should be a whole lot easier. I think, you know, good and everything positive all the time, and I should just be happy. But the reality is, life continues to be hard and difficult and challenging. As we were just talking at lunchtime here, you know, Christ didn't promise us uh, a life of ease. He said, in this world, you shall have what? Trouble. You shall have trouble, and that's a reality. But he said, take heart, right? I have overcome this world. And as we come into our text here, we take a look at this section in Malachi. The focus here is the people, their expectations haven't been met. They start to question God. They think God is not good, and they start complaining against the Lord. In fact, uh, even throughout the whole book, it's just been one complaint after another after another. And uh, it doesn't seem that they recognize that it's because of God's goodness and grace that they have anything at all. That they're in the land, that they have been prospering. The Lord has provided for them and has blessed them. And Malachi makes us ask, well, how are we serving Christ? What's our view of God? And are we serving out of duty or do we truly love him are we living for him rejoicing in what he has provided for us hb london said lord i need you to help me to see satisfactions in service enjoy partnership with you to delight in studying seeking and speaking for you and rescue me from the prison of merely doing my duty amen that's true i we don't serve out of duty. We serve because we love him. We want to give our best to the master. But the question comes then, do you crum grumble and complain when things aren't going your way? When you're challenged? When things are difficult? Do you rather charge God rather than look to him for grace and help to get you through those times of difficulty? So, as we look at our passage here, two points I set before you. First, we see the complaining that they have, the complaining about God, but then they're conversing about God, conversing about God. The people of Malachi's day had grown indifferent to God's great love. In fact, at the beginning of this book, in chapter 1, verse 2, the Lord declares, and he says, I have loved you, I love you. And we touched on that this morning, so I won't go into that. But uh, the response of the people was, in what way have you loved us? I mean, when we've come to the land here, things have been hard and difficult and challenging. They're not easy. And so they started to look at things from a very selfish, temporal perspective, as if God should be giving everything to them on a silver platter. Really, they shouldn't have to be working too hard for things. You know, God is the one who owns a cattle on a thousand hills. So, well, God should be giving me exactly what I need when I need it. 
and yet they found things more challenging and more difficult. But rather than to submit themselves to God in humility, they started to charge God foolishly. And here are a group of people who spoke arrogantly, harshly against the Lord. And the prophet confronts them. And he says to them, as uh, it says in verse 13, and the Lord says, your words have been harsh against me. I mean, he has told them already that they are to return to him. And of course, well, what do you mean? How shall we return to you? Didn't know that we were away from you. I mean, we're your covenant people. Uh, we belong to you. But he had already told them at the beginning of this chapter, or throughout this chapter, that he was going to come in judgment because there were sorcerers there, adulterers there, perjurers there, those who were exploiting other people, those who were exploiting the widows and the orphans. They had turned away the, the, uh, those who were non-Jewish who had come into the land, and, and they did not fear him. And so he comes to them, says, it's time for you to uh, repent and turn from yourself and for your sin. I'm a, coming as a refiner here. I'm going to take away the dross that's uh, come upon you. You need to be cleansed. Uh, you need to be purified. And of course, uh, will a man rob God? Yet you've robbed me, says the Lord. In what way have we robbed you? See the questioning. They're very arrogant. And what do you mean we're robbing you? What do you mean we're taking advantage of you? I mean, we, uh, we are the center of attention here. I mean, it seems like they're very self-focused. That God basically should be living for their happiness. And they go on to uh, say, it is useless to serve God. Verse 14, what profit is it that we have kept his ordinance, that we have walked as mourners before the Lord of hosts? And uh, even more sarcastic, uh, sarcastic mockery here to uh, call the proud blessed for those who do wickedness uh, are raised up and even tempt God and go free. See, those who... Uh, are uh, arrogant and prideful who continue on in, in outright sin and evil. The Lord doesn't do anything about it. And so they seem to be prospering and doing well. So why are we wasting our time serving God when we see uh, the, those, those who are evil prospering in their wickedness? Well, maybe we should just go ahead and do the same thing. Of course, uh, Remember, the psalmist in Psalm 73 had something to say about that. Are you familiar with that psalm? I mean, he said he had almost forgotten the goodness of the Lord, the mercy of God. He saw those who were arrogant and wicked as if they were prospering until what? What was the, what was the change in his thought and attitude? When he went into the sanctuary and he saw their latter end, they may be prospering temporally. And we, we can look at those who are in this world who are, are in rebellion against God and they think they're prospering and doing well. I don't, I don't need the Lord. I mean, we live in a prosperous country. I, I can provide for myself. I've got all the things that I need. Who needs God? And, and it's easy for us to be tempted to be jealous of these people. You know, they seem to be prospering. But here I am as a Christian. I'm the one suffering because I'm making the sacrifices uh, to serve God. I'm not carrying on in the wickedness or of the things of this world as others are. And it seems that I'm suffering for, the, for my sacrifices and those people aren't suffering because they're just given to their wanton uh, depravity and sin and so on. And it, it, it just doesn't seem fair. I mean, how many times have you thought, it just doesn't, why is it doesn't seem fair? Until I went into the sanctuary and I saw their ladder end because this world is temporal. Yes, they may prosper for a time, but as the Lord gives, the Lord also what? Takes away. And that was Job's testimony, isn't it? And so these people here in Malachi's day, they were sitting in judgment on God rather than submitting to his lordship over them. Sitting in judgment on God. It's vain to serve God. Vain to serve God. You can almost hear the disdain in their voice. Whenever we grumble about our circumstances or the wrong treatment that we have received, remember, if we are grumbling 
ultimately, who are we grumbling against? God. Because he's the one who controls our circumstances, does he not? God is directing your life, your affairs, everything about you by a, a wise providence and care. And so there are times when, yes, he actually does direct you into the valley, the valley of hardship and difficulty and pain. Remember Christ after his baptism? Where did the Spirit lead him? Remember? Where? In the wilderness, yeah. Into the wilderness experience where uh, he would, sorry? <laughs> be tested for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. The Spirit of God actually led him there into that experience. that there are times when the Spirit of God will actually lead you into the place of drought, into the place of testing, into the place of hardship, difficulty, and pain. And that's a reality. That's a reality. Does that mean that God is not good? He's very good. And so why is that? Why is it that the Lord, I mean, how come we... How come we don't have a wealth and health and prosperity and, and all, you know, in, in terms of that gospel? Because God knows you. He knows your heart. He knows your desires. He knows the things that you depend upon. He knows what you need. And there's times when he actually has to take things away from you in order for you to recognize how much you need him. How much you need to depend upon him. Not on your own means or resources or abilities, but rather to depend upon him. But the reality is we're very much prone to complain and grumble when God takes us to that place of hardship and difficulty and pain. We think, well, what's going on? You know, look at other people in the church. Look at brother and sister so-and-so. I mean, they're doing really well. He just got a, an advancement in his job, and he's got a you know, everything's going well for them, and they're going on this wonderful trip, and, and uh, everything's falling into place for them. And here I lost my job. And things are going to be harder. I, how am I going to pay my rent? How are we going to provide food? I mean, things are going to be more expensive. Um, I mean, uh, carbon tax is going up, so I'm going to have to pay more for gas. Why is it so difficult and hard? And, and, and we can just complain about all these things, but the reality is we're complaining to God and we're telling him, you're not fair. You're not fair because you're prospering these people and you're making it more hard and difficult for me. And why is that? Israel was given to grumbling and complaining, remember? When the uh, Lord redeemed them and brought them out of slavery in Egypt. I mean, here... He just brought them out with this wonderful, powerful, mighty hand. He had parted the Red Sea, and he was leading them into the promised land. And they should have gone directly to the promised land. But what prevented them from going forward? They had forsaken God. They had gone to the mount that God had directed them to. I believe it's Mount Sinai. And rather than continue to worship God, they set up the golden calf. They're worshiping this. And they think, well, this is the God. This is what brought you out of uh, bondage, out of Egypt. And, of course, Moses came. He was angry. He, he actually smashed the, the tablets. And God said, you're going into the wilderness. And, of course, they're in the wilderness for how long? Another 40 days, right? 40 days? 40 years, thank you. <laughs> Jesus was 40 days. Israel 40 years. And of course, while they're in the wilderness, complaining, grumbling, they'd rather return to slavery in Egypt than to trust their covenant God who brought them out of that slavery, who had a purpose to bless them and bring them into a land of milk and honey, a land of plenty. 
But as they're enduring the hardship in the wilderness, I mean, they even grumbled about the manna that God had faithfully given to them. Remember, he had furnished them a table in the wilderness. If it was not for the sustaining hand of God upon them, they would have perished. They would have perished. In Numbers, in the book of Numbers, chapter 11, verse 5, it says, We remember the fish which we ate freely in Egypt, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, the garlic. But now our whole being is dried up. There is nothing at all except this manna before our eyes. They were actually longing for slavery. Longing for slavery because they thought they were better off. I mean, isn't that amazing? Isn't there times where, while the Lord has saved me, he brought me to himself with a mighty hand, but you know what? There were aspects of my life that was actually better before I became a Christian. I mean, we can actually think that way because now I'm having to sacrifice. I'm having to restrain myself. I'm having to live for God. And we can become cold in our hearts, especially when we've been a Christian for a while. We're not getting uh, the blessings that we should, especially when we're reading God's Word. In fact, Mary and I were talking about this. I mean, there are those who read the Scriptures, the Bible, and it's very easy to think, well, I've read it already. I know it. And because I've read it and I know it, you know, I just don't get anything out of it anymore. I mean, has that been your experience? Why read the Bible? I've already read it. I've uh, familiarized myself with it. I'm not getting anything out of it now. And so I should just close the book, put it on a shelf. That's complete. And now just move on to something else. But is that the attitude of the Christian? I mean, what do you say to someone who basically tells you that I don't get anything out of the Bible. It doesn't touch my heart, it doesn't touch my life. I'm not moved by it. I'm not encouraged or strengthened by it. And I shared with Mary at lunchtime an illustration of a grandfather with his grandson, and they're out fishing. And as they're fishing, The grandson says to the grandfather, you know, uh, I read the Bible, but I really don't get much from it anymore. It doesn't really do anything for me. I'm not really profiting from it. And uh, so I'm just, I'm thinking about giving it up, just not read the Bible anymore. And you know what the grandfather did? You know how he responded to that? I mean, they're fishing. He says, well, grandson, here's here's a fishing basket. And what I want you to do is I want you to put that basket in the water and see if you can catch any fish. Just with the basket. Not with the fishing rod or anything else. Just put the basket in the water and see if fish end up in the basket. And so he puts the basket in the water beside the boat. And then, okay, lift it up. Any fish in the, in the basket? No fish. All right, put the basket in the water again. Any fish? Nothing yet. One more time. See if there's any fish in that basket. Nothing the third time. And you know what the grandfather's response is? Well, reading the Bible, reading the scriptures, it may seem like you're not getting anything out of it, like it's not making an impact, it's not touching you the way you think it should be. But like that basket, he says, even though you didn't catch any fish in the basket, the basket's a whole lot cleaner, isn't it? Because it spent time in the water. It was getting washed. It was getting cleansed. And you know the impact that this Bible has on you? It has a cleansing effect on your mind and on your thinking. It helps you to turn yourself away from thinking the way this world does, the corruption of the world, the sinfulness of the world, the attitude of the world, and it enables you to think in a biblical, godly way because this is God's revelation to you. This is not just like every, any other book, like a novel or a story that you'd have on your shelf. This is the living word of God. This is God's revelation. He speaks to you through this book. And that's why when you read this book, you could read the same chapter again and again and again and actually get something different from it each time. And why is that? Because God has something to say to you. God wants to speak to you. And that's why this is a living book. But yet we can still complain and think, oh, well, I read the Bible and... 
it's so familiar and the words, I, I've read it already. And, but yet, when we come before God in prayer, we're to read this book prayerfully and contemplatingly and meditate as God speaks to us. Remember, it's not just that he's speaking to our minds, giving us a knowledge of himself. What is he ultimately speaking to? Your heart, your life. And the Bible has a cleansing effect in your attitude and how you live so that you will understand who God is. You need to know God if you're going to live for him. You need to know Christ if you're ultimately going to serve him and have faith. And it comes through this right here. Do not, do not forsake the reading of the scriptures. Be given to it daily. Wherever you can squeeze it into your routine, squeeze it in because you profit from it. You profit from it. And it's so important to you. And these people in Malachi's day, you know, they're, they're questioning God. What profit is it in it to serve the Lord? You know, um, it's vain. It, I'm wasting my time to serve the Lord. In fact, uh, when, they, when they say, what profit is it? Uh, the, the, the Hebrew term there for profit is a technical term for a, a weaver cutting a piece of cloth free from the loom. And so the idea is that these people expected their cut, right? Their percentage, much as, uh, you know, one who is working uh, sales and, you know, you have your, your, your percentage from, from that sale. You get your, your 5%, your 10%, whatever that percentage is. I get my cut from the sale. Well, that's what they're expecting, you know, that uh, God was going to enrich them materially, and if God doesn't enrich them materially, then that means that God is not blessing. And so they're grumbling. God hadn't given, their, given them their fair share. And so that's where certainly we need to be careful. The flesh is inclined to self-pity, self-focus, self-centeredness. We are, all of us. And if you have this idea or thought that is a, as I serve God, as I live for him, that somehow there must be something in it whereby I should be able to live a more comfortable life as a result of it. That I deserve happiness as a Christian. Prosperity. But that, again, that's a false gospel. Because remember, Jesus is not an Aladdin's genie waiting in a lamp to grant you three wishes. God isn't just a genie. Where, okay, or, or uh, one illustration I, I share with our folks is that God is not a vending machine where you just kind of punch a few buttons and then you know how the chips come and they drop down. And, God is not a vending machine where we just hit some buttons and then we just expect God to give us what we want so that now we're happy. I mean, does God live for your happiness? Remember, naturally, what are we? Sinners, sinful, with a sinful nature, a corrupt nature. And so unfortunately, when uh, we, have, we express our natural desires, our natural desires, are they always for God or against him? Against him, right? And so is God going to, does God exist so that you can be and continue to be happy in your sinfulness, in your depravity, in your sin? Or does he want you to turn from yourself and your depravity and your uh, desire uh, for uh, 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 selfishness and wickedness and so on, and to make you holy and pure, to be uh, that refiner of fire, as it were, as he states here. And there's times, if he's going to cleanse you, he's got to bring you through the fire. He comes as that refiner, 
of silver and gold. But when that one who puts the silver and gold in the fire, is it with the desire to destroy the silver and the gold? Is that the aim? I just want it to burn up and come to nothing? No, he wants it to be pure, right? He wants the pure silver, the pure gold, because that metal is precious to the one who's refining it. How much more precious are we? When God puts you through the fire, it doesn't mean that he's doing so to destroy you, to destroy your faith but rather to refine you, to make you pure and holy, one who is truly resting in him, looking to him. That's what he's doing. That's what he's doing. What's in it for you if you serve the Lord? What's in it for you? Is it worthwhile to serve God? Are you wasting your time when you serve God? Will it come to nothing? If you serve God, I mean, he gives us abundantly, abundantly above all that we ask or think. I mean, recognize the fact that God loved you so richly and so powerfully. He gave Jesus for you. It was Jesus who ultimately suffered for you. Uh, Anything that we endure does not even continue to measure up to what Jesus has suffered for us. Remember what we're facing. I mean, the most difficult part of your life, remember, is not in this world. I mean, even if you went through the most worst, the worst hardship, pain, and suffering, again, that doesn't compare to facing a God who will pour out his wrath and his judgment upon sin and sinners. I mean, is there anyone, anyone who can stand up to the living God and face the living God? Remember Isaiah. Isaiah had a vision of the Lord in chapter 6. And do you remember what that vision was? He saw the Lord high and lifted up his train, filling the temple. He heard the cries, holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. He had this, uh, in- this incredible vision of the majesty and the holiness of God, the exalted nature of God. And what was his response? Did he come with a, a list of complaints and, you know, why aren't you doing this in my life and why are you doing that and, and things don't seem fair, and it's really hard being a prophet right now in Israel because, you know, I try to preach, and these people, you know, they're just so hard-hearted, and, you know, they're not coming, they're not serving, and, you know, how come, right? Is that, is that Isaiah's response when he sees that vision of God? I mean, I know you're familiar with this passage. And what does he cry? He cries out. And what does he cry out? Woe is me, isn't it? First thing, woe is me. I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell among a people of... He sees the sinfulness of sin. He recognizes that, uh, you know, if I stand before this holy God, I will be consumed. This judgment is so real and so powerful. There's none who can stand before this holy God. I mean, that's why the judgment of God is eternal in its, in its nature. But does God leave him there in that place of sin and sinfulness, of wretchedness? What does God do? Right? Sends the angel. The angel takes the coal from off the altar. And he says, there, this has touched you. This has touched your lips. Now you're made clean. God's desire is to make us clean. And, of course, that altar is a picture of that future offering and sacrifice that Christ would make for us upon Calvary's cross. And he took the coal specifically off the altar, the altar where the, the burnt sacrifice was made. And in terms of the ceremonial law, that pointed forward to the ultimate sacrifice that Christ would make for you. God's desire is to cleanse you. And there's times it means refining through the fire, as it were, so that we recognize also the sinfulness of sin before a holy God. God doesn't want you to continue on in your sin. He wants you to turn from it, to turn to him and come to him so that you'll forsake death because that's where sin leads, isn't it? The wages of sin is always what? Death. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He wants you to have life. That's his desire. But then these ones come along and complaining about 
There's circumstances, there's situation, and you're not giving me what I think I deserve. You're not giving me what I think I, uh, you know, what I want. And God is not some divine Santa Claus that just kind of pours out the gifts in, in, in the way that we think they should come. But God's desire is to have the hearts of these ones to turn from their selfishness and to come to him. They complain. They complain about God. But thankfully, there's a second group here mentioned, is there not? Those who are conversing about God, speaking about God. Uh, verse 16, And those who feared the Lord spoke to one another. And does it say that the Lord ignored them, turned away from them? No, oh, the Lord listened, heard them. A book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. He says, they shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts. In the day that I make, up, make them my jewels, I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. And you shall again discern between the righteous and the wicked, between the one who serves God and the one who does not serve him. God always has a faithful remnant who loves and serves him. And these ones, as they are speaking concerning the Lord, as they fear the Lord, as they are meditating upon his name, remember, it's not just because they have decided to do so. It's because God is at work in the lives of his people. He gives us the grace and the ability to recognize God as sovereign in our lives. Remember, it's not just Jesus, our Savior, and we're certainly thankful for Christ, our Savior, the one who died for us, gave himself for us, so that now I might have this new life uh, through him. But it's also Jesus, my Lord, my Master. I want to serve him and give him my best. It says, they that feared the Lord respected him, recognized his sovereignty, recognized that he, I'm not the master here. I'm not the one in control. It's not my will be done, but thy will be done. Right? Thy will be done. In fact, uh, to fear the Lord is to recognize the fact that I'm to be aware of him at all times, to live in the full awareness of God. Right? This goes back to this idea of not compartmentalizing. It's not that I have my church life and then I have my work life, my social life, my family life, and, but I am to live in the full awareness of God at all times and that uh, I have a, a respect and an awe for him, very much the way Isaiah did when he saw the Lord in that exalted position, that vision of the holy God. He has a, an awareness of God, but it leads to respect and honor. Because it's very easy to give lip service to God, to say, yes, I'm a Christian, but again, to live as a practical atheist as we go out into this world. It's as our brother David had said about, uh, and, and one of the ladies in the back talked about the need for prayer for children and the internet and so on. You know, when you are living in a, an awareness of God, that comes through in all aspects of your daily routine. So if you're online, I mean, as, as Dave said, I mean, there's many wonderful, encouraging, positive things that you can find online. But what prevents you or keeps you from clicking on those questionable websites and going into those areas that, wait a minute, this is not good, this is not holy, in fact, this is pretty wretched and pretty wicked and pretty evil, carnal. What prevents you from going in that direction? It's because you're living in an awareness of God. I don't serve myself. I don't serve my carnality, my sin, and so on. I don't... Because remember, that's a reflection of the, of the fact that we're slaves to sin and to Satan. But I don't want to be a slave to Satan. I don't want to be a slave to my sin, my own sin nature, and so on. I actually want to serve the Lord. I want to love Christ. And so it comes down to as I'm living in an awareness of God, I say to my heart, I say to myself, Lord, I love you more. I love you more. I don't want to give in to my sinful nature. I don't want to give in to temptation. 
I don't want to choose or make those choices that basically are turning my heart against you. But rather, I want to love you more. And because I love you more, I'm going to endeavor to be holy and to seek purity and to live according to his word. I mean, that's what living in the awareness of God does. It actually protects you too. Protecting you even from yourself. Protecting you from yourself. But that's grace, right? Grace at work in your life. God at work in your life. Giving you a greater love for him as opposed to a love for this world and the things of this world. And so those who feared the Lord, and uh, notice Lord there is in all capitals, so that's the covenant name of God, Jehovah. And so it highlights the fact that we're in this covenant relationship with the Lord. Remember, we belong to him. He belongs to us, you know, in that mutual uh, life that we enjoy together. And, and even throughout this passage, he calls himself the Lord of hosts. And uh, we understand this in three ways. The Lord of hosts. He's the Lord of the hosts of, uh, of creation. I mean, we look at... Uh, uh, the stars and everything that God has made. He's the Lord of everything. He upholds it. He's also the uh, Lord of um, the, uh, the, the, the hosts of, um, of, um, of Israel, God's people, right? the church. He's the Lord of uh, uh, God, is the Lord of his people. And uh, he's also the, uh, the Lord of everything uh, in this world. But these people are called righteous. The Lord, they spoke to one another. The Lord heard them. He listened to them. And uh, he calls them my jewels. I will spare them. I will, my judgment will not come upon them. He, he doesn't say that about these other ones. These other ones, those who are complaining and focused upon uh, themselves and of uh, their own lives and so on, uh, they would be uh, left in that place of judgment. But he says, these ones I'm going to spare as a man spares his own son who serves him. His desire is to set them apart even unto himself as one who spares his son. So I will spare my people, those who belong to me. Because these ones esteemed him, feared him, thought upon him, recognized him a desire to serve and to love him. And how important it is for us as we endeavor to live this Christian life, and this certainly goes back to what I was talking about this morning, how we need to pray, Lord, strengthen my heart, strengthen my faith, because I'm in a spiritual battle right now, and that battle is real. Ephesians 6, right? Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might that we might stand against the attacks of the evil one, to put on, what are we to put on? The whole armor of God, so that we may withstand those temptations attack when they come. So God gives us the means whereby we can stand and protect ourselves when those spiritual attacks come or those temptations come. When Satan appears as an angel of light, making us think, well, it's a good thing if I uh, rebel against God. I mean, that was the lie that uh, Satan presented to Eve, wasn't it, at the very beginning in the garden? That it was a good thing to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, make someone wise, and that this would be something good and positive. Remember, Adam and Eve already had a knowledge of good because they were made righteous and holy and with knowledge. But what was the knowledge that they gained the moment they ate the fruit? evil and that's true you're right <laughs> that's coming but the thing is, the reality is that that when they ate of that fruit it gave them a knowledge of evil they already had a knowledge of good and of course were they better off for it are we better off for it absolutely not i mean this is what the lord needs to save us from this knowledge of evil evil within our own hearts. 
But uh, these ones, they were conversing together, speaking to one another, how important it is for Christian fellowship. You know, not only we enjoy this closeness, this fellowship with God, but of course this closeness and fellowship that we have with each other. I mean, we encourage and strengthen each other. I mean, this time of corporate worship, I love the fact that you have lunch every Sunday. You know, here's an opportunity where you can speak to one another, encourage one another. And every time you speak to your brothers and sisters in Christ and you talk to them about the Lord, how does God respond to this? In fact, he says he wants to remember it. And that it's so important to him that he, he, he has a book of remembrance and he and he and he writes it out and writes it down i mean i see some of you writing notes right now and that's wonderful because you want to remember what's being said but god and it seems rather unusual that uh, we have this kind of language like how would how is it that god would forget anything he, he should remembers all things but he's just highlighting the reality of that this is vitally important to him i want to remember every time my people speak about my name who glorify me, who talk of me, my goodness, my grace, my son, my salvation, my spirit. We speak of the scriptures and the word of God, and it just highlights how important God is to us and how much we need him and that we want to encourage each other in these things. And so these people are noticed and they're cared for because God listened in fact, that word listen means to raise the ears as an animal does when it hears something. I mean, who has a dog here? Remember when you call your dog, your pet, immediately the ears go up, doesn't it? And then uh, he responds. Well, he should respond. He's not always obedient. I have a dog that's a little wayward. Um, but to, to, to hear, right, as the ears go up. And, and heard means to bend over so you, you don't miss a word. You want to make sure you hear everything, drawing close. And so God, he desires to hear your words, to remember you, to remember your service. He doesn't want to forget that what you have said and what you have done. I mean, we could say this in a positive realm and in a negative realm, in a positive way, you know, we think of the fact that every time I uh, reverence God, serve God, speak of Christ, uh, share Christ, uh, share the gospel with others, God remembers, he knows it, he sees it. As well as every time, unfortunately, when we fail God and we turn from him, we don't do what, that which is good and right and so on. What's the difference? Well, when we fail God and we turn from him and do not do what is good, we can also confess our sins, and he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But in this way, may we recognize that every time we endeavor to speak of Christ, it means that he's important to us. He's in my life. He's in my heart. And I can't help but talk about him. You know, there was a point in, uh, I believe it's Jeremiah's existence, Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet. And there was time when he went out and he preached, and did Israel respond to his message? No. They rebelled against God. And he, and he became so frustrated that he decided that uh, maybe I should just give up. What's the point? You know, here I am being the prophet of God, preaching his word, and the people aren't responding. They just continue on in their uh, disobedience and their rebellion, and they're not turning. And so why should I continue Shouldn't I just give up? Why am I wasting my time doing this? But why did, why did he not give up? Why did he continue? Do you know this? It's because the word of God burned in his heart like a fire, and he could not but continue. And ultimately, that's, that's what we need, isn't it? That's what I pray for. Lord, may your word burn in my life, burn in my heart like a fire. It's like the two that were on the road to Emmaus. As they spent time with Jesus, and he spoke to them, and he taught them, and, and talked to them. What, what was the response from the two? Did not our hearts burn within us when he spoke with us by the way? Like a holy fire that's in my soul. I mean, that's something that I trust that we all desire. Lord, I need your word to burn within me, your spirit within me. 
giving me this power and this love. I might know you fully. And so, as uh, Paul told us in 1 Corinthians 15, in verse 58, he says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And why is that? Why are we to be steadfast, unmovable, and always abounding? For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord, you are not wasting your time when you serve Christ, when you sacrifice for Him, when you endure hardship and suffering and difficulty for Him. The difference is when we face those hardships, those pains and those difficulties, difficulties what are we going to do? Are we either going to complain and grumble and think, why, Lord? It's like Israel in the wilderness, all this manna. I'd rather have the cucumbers the leeks, all those good things in Egypt. I mean, they, are we going to complain? Or are we going to say, Lord, it's from your hand. I may not understand, but you're good. Your sovereign will is being worked out in my life. Uh, this is maybe cleansing, us, cleansing me from dr like the dross. You're purifying me, but you're doing a work in my heart so that I no longer depend upon the things of this life and of this world, and I'll come to the place where I ultimately depend upon you for everything. Lord, help me depend upon you for everything. Because then I know that all things will work together for my what? Good. Because that's what's happening, isn't it? Remember, the one who's refining the gold and the silver, he's not putting it in the fire to destroy it. Why is he putting it in the fire? purify it because the gold is precious to him the silver is precious to him how much more is are you precious to christ remember that and if you're going through some difficulty or hardship or something you know not going your way right now don't think that god has forsaken you he's doing a work in you he's doing a work in you that's probably necessary for you right now and at the end of the day, it's going to be for your good. But don't have a complaining spirit about it. Just say, Lord, I submit myself to you. Guide me through it. Give me help. Give me your spirit. Help me to be content. Because, Lord, I know that this is working together for my good. And so, two choices. Complaining, complaining, conversing, speaking of, reverencing. <clears throat> acknowledging, knowing that he's at work in my heart, in my life. Amen. Let's bow in prayer. Father, thank you for this passage here in Malachi. Father, this was during... ...content with such things as you have, for he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear... What can man do to me? And now receive the Lord's blessing, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.